Great to see uh, all of your smiling faces. We have, uh, we have an awesome uh, panel discussion uh, here for you this morning. We're going to talk about healthcare administration. And I've heard, listened to several of the other uh, panels this morning, and it's, I think, a fairly common topic. It's sort of interesting to me, uh, given where we sit as availability, that the process of administering healthcare has taken on um, a lot of new energy and excitement uh, over the last uh, several years. It's always been exciting to us, having been at uh, the process of simplifying uh, healthcare administration, particularly the relationship between providers and health plans, uh, having been at that for over two decades now, I, I joke sometimes. I went back a few years ago and I found the um, original strategy slide uh, from when Availity started. And as some of you know, Availity was started as a joint venture between two health plans, Florida Blue and Humana, uh, still two of our investor plans and large customers, along with Elevance, uh, Gita's firm, and HCSC. And we serve every, almost every health plan in the country and millions of providers. But I went back and found an, originally, an original uh, strategy slide, and it said, we're going to create this organization to drive uh, tech, you know, leverage technology, to drive um, automation uh, and reduce abrasion in the relationship between health plans and providers. We estimate that the size and scale of that problem today, and this is in 2001, was $150 million, right? Today, we talk about uh, administrative abrasion, administrative workflow, the challenges uh, in that, just between providers and plans in the tens of billions of dollars. So I joke sometimes that availability is a bit of a test of whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, right? If you're a pessimist, you might look and say, you guys have been at this for two decades and all you've done is make the problem bigger. I don't believe that, quite frankly. Uh, if you're an optimist, uh, you might look at it and say, well, first they underclubbed the size of the problem back in 2001, which I think is probably true. Um, but more to the point, I think healthcare has become more complex uh, over the last 20 years. When you think about um, technology and procedures and disease uh, management and all the things that we try to leverage technology to do today that we weren't doing back in 2001, um, you realize that the scope and scale of the, the challenge in creating an efficient and effective administrative process in healthcare is, um, it's huge, it's daunting, uh, but it's one that we have to uh, get after and, uh, and solve. Um, if you're me, you get really enthusiastic about that because on one hand, you see that we are sort of single-handedly keeping the facts industry alive in healthcare. Uh, I joke quite frequently that our, at our annual client conference, I can't wait to blow up a fax machine uh, in a few years when we get rid of the last one. Um, but you see great uh, innovation that has happened and I believe very positive momentum in the uh, relationship between health plans and providers uh, by leveraging technology. So, uh, so that's the context that we really want to approach today's discussion from. We're going to talk about technology a bit. Uh, obviously, we're all excited about the application of um, AI and net new technologies to drive solutions, but where we're really going to focus, I think, is, um, you know, what's the end goal and how do you get there, right? How do you really create a more efficient healthcare system? So we have a phenomenal panel. Uh, panel. I'll ask my panelists to take just a minute and introduce yourselves uh, in your first answer to each question. Um, so let's get started. So we will start, because uh, we've got some great technologists on our panel, so we'll start with a little bit of a technology discussion. AI has gone from an industry uh, buzzword to really creating some powerful new tools with, with real and purposeful uh, applications and implications in healthcare. Um, where do you most readily see its immediate applications? Where do you get bang for the buck in ROI uh, to solve some of the more complex challenges in healthcare administration? And specifically in your organizations, how are you thinking about leveraging net new technologies to improve things like patient engagement and what benefits have you seen and uh, what's working and what's, what's not? So Gita, I'm gonna, I'll call on you, uh, call on you first. Uh, love to get your perspective on that. Sure, <clears throat> so um, um, the Chief Technology Officer at Elevance Health and I'm responsible for our whole health advocacy and provider experience platforms, which includes our care management, utilization management, uh, contact center technologies, and um, GNA. 
So <clears throat> I think it's really a good intersection um, we're at or an inflection point we're at right now, Russ, um, when it comes to uh, the things that we care about and that we're um, mainly uh, ensuring that the administrative burden is reduced. So, for example, those technology systems that we have, um, I think <coughs> the speaker earlier, George, um, spoke about like um, making sure that we equip our associates to do, have the conversations, but it also makes sure that we uh, enable that engagement to happen with uh, patients or members, right? And I think um, how we're looking at technologies and how we're looking at the experience, um, you know, if I go upstream, mm -hmm. uh, I've got opportunities um, in three main areas, in benefits, offs, and claims. Great. Right? And so I think yep. uh, that's important for me to make sure that administratively, I'm very uh, focused on like what can be um, on our members' mind and also our providers' mind. Like 10% of our calls that we have uh, come from both members and providers are, are completely interlocked. So I think you know as we uh, are looking at newer technologies uh, and looking at engagement, we've got to look at um, three main areas. We've got to look at automation, we've got to look at uh, insights, and we've got to look at experience in tandem. And so as we think about those, and we'll get into more detail, uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to remember the intersection of those, the experiences that I just spoke about in terms of administrative burden, and seeing how we can like, um, reduce the administrative waste that there is. And a lot of it is rework. You know, when you talk about faxes, you talk about uh, things that we get in, there's a lot of rework that's um, going on. And, and I think being uh, maniacally focused on the pragmatics of our industry is important as well, as well as the experience that we are trying to deliver for our providers and our uh, members. So I, I love that approach. Uh, we've obviously worked directly on some of those, but picking those very specific problems to solve and then thinking about how tech can enable solutions to those problems is where I think you get both real results and candidly in large organizations mm -hmm. like you all three um, are leaders uh, in, get the proof points you need to get permission to keep keep going. So Chris, maybe I'll turn the same yeah. question to you and how are you guys thinking about it and, <clears throat> and uh, get your answer. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I am Chris LaPree. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Evernorth. And unlike Russ, I do not have 20, 30 plus years <laughs> of experience in healthcare. I'm three and a half years into healthcare after a, a long career in banking. And um, like some of my, my colleagues in the room here, um, probably came into healthcare with the idea that we would be able to quickly drive change. Gita and I were talking about this in the background. Healthcare is really, really, really complex, um, but the opportunity is there. The opportunity is there to reduce administrative burden, and there's a lot of ways to do it. I loved what Gita said. Um, I also have responsibility for contact center stuff, and. Uh, we had actually a big implementation this morning, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> Good for you. Um, but I, I think the key there is, is putting the, the patient at the center of what we do, but also the advocate or concierge, the agent, empowering them to yeah. do their job easier such that they can deliver that more seamless experience to the patient. And it, the same goes towards the providers who are interacting with us as a, as a payer. We need to make their work that much easier so they can focus on their job, which is to care for the patient, not do, um, I guess, a third of their time spent yeah. on administrative tasks. Yeah, George's example was a really interesting one, mm. right? That he spent an hour and 15 minutes with his doc who then had to go back that night and enter all the same information into another yeah. system. Yeah, and so call um, transcript analysis or for ambient listening, uh, a panelist said yesterday, those technologies are really powerful. Mario Schlosser talked about testing out the listening to the calls, doing the transcripts, providing that back to the agent to check and make sure it's accurate. That reduces administrative burden. They can get on the next call that much faster. But it also works in the physician context. Why not be listening, taking the notes, and then having an aspect of sampling and checking to make sure it's accurate? Yep. Um, those opportunities are, are here for us now. I'll stick with you for a minute, right? Because uh -oh. you said something. Yeah, no. So I've already warned these guys. I'm a reform lawyer. So <laughs> yes, once I get is. going on questions. He, he said two times he's a lawyer. Now this is the third time I'm a little worried. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little worried too. Um, but coming out of banking, right? I've, I've met a number of 
technology leaders over the years that have come from other sectors, particularly financial services, I've hired them myself into Availity. You know, we had a CTO who came out of financial services. Our current CTO, Jack Hunt, came out of financial services. The learning curve is super steep. I'm just wondering about your perspective on what did you expect to see when you arrived in healthcare versus what you actually have experienced over yeah. three years? Just sort of, I think that'd be very helpful to everyone to, to understand that. Because most of us, I'm sure, are healthcare people. Colin came out of banking as well, but yeah. you know, we're kind of healthcare people. We, there's a little bit of maybe Stockholm syndrome you know, in the room, yeah. I would imagine. Love to get your perspective on it. Again, I would come back to banking technologists have a little bit of ego <laughs> and had, you know, we all have heard that healthcare was that much yeah. further behind the technology adoption curve of digital and cloud and other things. To a certain extent, that's true. Yeah. Um, to a certain extent, that is because of how complex healthcare is. So I am three and a half years in, I'm, I learn every single day an additional nuance. Yeah of the healthcare system. Um, and I've had over the last several years, had to experience it more in my personal life with one of my children. And I'm amazed by how far we've gotten, but there's so much left to do. This is the hardest um, industry that I know of. Yeah. So many parties involved and the, the stakes couldn't be higher. Mm -hmm. um, people live and die based on the technology that we provide, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that's that's real and it's scary, but it's also highly motivating. Again, Gita and I were talking about it before. Super hard problems and super smart people in healthcare. This is where we need to focus as a country. Yeah, I completely completely agree. I've always theorized that one of the big differences between financial services, consumer services, uh, and other sectors is we always have to remember that physicians practice medicine, right? Yeah. It's not an exact science. There's not just one way to do things. Unlike financial services, yes, there's a lot of analytics that goes into whether it's making stock picks or you know whatever it may be, but you're dealing with fairly structured data and fairly um, consistent concepts, right? You know, math is math to a degree versus um, Healthcare is a very, very personal, and B, it's a bit more subjective in the application of, um, you know, of practice. We have a personal experience I've shared with a lot of people before, where our daughter was very ill and um, needed an MRI, uh, and we had a battle with our, you know, in, in the moment, right? Needed a, 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 a MRI, and had a battle with the plan over whether that would be off, right? And yeah. I end up on the phone. Fortunately, I think we're all blessed that we have great relationships and can make these calls. I end up on the phone with a plan. And we went from, you know, struggling to get the auth approved to her being in the operating room for brain surgery in 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And but for the approval of that auth, right? And the MRI that showed the infection. And, you know, I still get a little emotional about it when I think about it, but, um, you know, that is, it was, a, it was a rounding attending physician who said she needs this MRI immediately. Everybody else thought it was a headache, mm -hmm. right? And that just goes to show you how um, personal and, again, sort of subjective this can be in the moment. Um, I want to turn to Colin uh, now because, you know, look, EMIDS is a technology company. Thank you again to EMIDS for your partnership. Here, this is my favorite conference period full stop. I love coming to this uh, every year. Um, so the conversation is always gonna be, I think, sort of led around the tech conversation. Um, but uh, we really need to think about some of the human applications of this as well. And um, Colin, you're, you're I know, new to your role. Um, we all work with multiple entities and multiple stakeholders all with competing incentives and, you know, maybe different alignments and different business goals. How do you think about, from, from your role at Centene, how do you think about moving the uh, cheese of people on some of the intangible things uh, that we know have to change in order to really drive automation and, you know, get adoption of technology uh, solutions? How do, you, how do you find better alignment with your stakeholders, both internal and then external? 
Yeah, good question. So hi everybody, I'm Colin Tony. Uh, I'm Executive Vice President of Network and Partnerships at Centene. And I've been with the company for about five years. Uh, I spend most of that time, as Russ said, this is a, a relatively new role for me. I, I stepped into it uh, at the beginning of this year. And I spent most of my time here doing M&A and strategy. And before joining Centene, I, I also came from banking. I did investment banking at Allen & Company uh, as my career before coming to Centene. And advise technology and media and healthcare companies on M&A and capital raising. Uh, it's, I, I also had an eye-opening moment when I came into inside the yeah, company. Yeah. Uh, it, it was, there were a lot of surprising things about the, the way the healthcare system is built around technology. Um, we, our company is, is mostly Medicaid still. So we grew up as a Medicaid company. It's our DNA. Uh, we have roughly two-thirds of our revenue are, uh, are Medicaid. The rest is split between marketplace, a fast-growing marketplace business, and then Medicare. And, uh, the, and, and I'm not a, a technologist. The, I think we, the question of incentives is really good. We have to figure out wh who inside of our company is incentivized to do things that are not just rowing in the same direction. That exists. I'm sure that exists at, at every company. Um, we have pockets of the business that are focused on their own goals. I mean, we discussed payment integrity is a, is a piece of the Great business example. that has their own goals. Yep. Um, we need to make sure that some of those goals, which are built around, let's face it, the, you know, the system as it existed in the past, um, are updated so that we're all trying to do the same as a company. We're all trying to, to do the same thing to, to move the ball forward instead of having pockets that are siloed uh, and stuck facing problems of the past when we could just get past those problems and, and evaluate new solutions. And the question of technolo how technology uh, impacts all of this is, is a, a broad one, but uh, from the Medicaid lens, yeah. which, which we still have, there, you talked about stakeholders. Some of our stakeholders are these internal groups and, and, and internal alignment, that's our job. We're, we're doing that, um, working to improve, room for improvement. Uh, we have a lot of external stakeholders that also have really different opinions and priorities. And so as, as a Medicaid company, we've got 32 different states that have 32 different sets of priorities. They're not totally different, there are a lot of commonalities across those states. They all care about behavioral, for, for instance. They all care yeah. about you know, maternal um, mortality, things like this. But they approach them differently. And the federal government, obviously, is, is a, a big payer of our business as well. So the vast majority of our revenue comes in from government sources. So government priorities yeah. have a huge impact on what we have to prioritize as well. And the question of technology and innovation and AI is an interesting one. Um, and Vice President Harris talked about this yesterday, about uh, needing to have some constraints around those things. Yeah. But we also just have to step back sometimes and look at the practical realities of what our members need. I mean, we're here to serve our members. Um, there is a question of what is innovation, which is always a nebulous question. But in, in this particular instance, uh, I, one of the things that I was surprised about when I came to Centene and I was talking with a, a variety of young and exciting companies and we were investing in some and it was, you know, we were bringing these, what I thought were quite innovative solutions to our customers, to the states, um, to our members. Yeah. And one of the pieces of feedback was, why are you doing that? We need you to do these other things. And, and it, got, it led us into this debate, a good debate about what is innovation and one of our state uh, plans said, the state government said to one of our state plans, I know that you think that's innovation. To me, innovation is sending a crib to yeah. an expectant mother who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's just one example. There, there are many, many, many examples, but we, we do need to take the priorities of our stakeholders for innovation in as we consider how we're going to use technology to do things, make sure we're living up to their expectations and the practical needs of our members. That's a fascinating example. Yeah. Being aligned with your customers is, because we're likewise in a transformation process and really trying to find ways to be more innovative and making sure you're talking to your customers about that is uh, super critical. Um, <clears throat> let's stick with that theme for a minute. And I think, Colin, it really reflects sort of what you just said. Are there collaboration models that you are using in the market, whether it's with your customers or with your business partners or even your technology partners that are new and innovative and sort of creative ways to think about driving change um, 
uh, and aligning with your stakeholders. Gidi, you want to take a crack at sure. that one? So, and I think, um, you know, Russ, Availity is a, a massive uh, partner that we're in tandem thinking about how do we how do we look a lot more upstream, as I was saying, and I think uh, uh, coming to the table and saying there's potentially a solution that looks like this right now, but we're not sure if it has application, and so can you help us with the application and see how we mold those together? And I think that openness and that transparency between stakeholders, partners, um, and stakeholders also in, inside of the house. Um, I think you mentioned, Colin, about different incentives, right? And <clears throat> I think in the past, um, we've been okay with silos, potentially, yeah, yeah. right? And so there could be a lot of silos between, you know, uh, different areas between different technology areas, different um, operational areas, do things something different in Medicaid versus Medicare mm -hmm. or, or commercial, right? And so uh, I think we've had to step back as an organization, yeah. as a collective with our stakeholders, our partners, and say, what are we trying to do? If you're trying to do end-to-end, -end, then you have to think end-to-end, -end, but also make it easy to work end-to-end. -end. Yep. And that means that my incentives have to be lined up with the overarching incentives, so that individual goals, that we're, we're working, um, <clears throat> we have operational partners, we, we say this is what we're lining up to, yep. and if I make these savings, they're gonna translate into an yep. operational area. Interesting. And I think um, more and more you're gonna see um, platform orientation. Mm -hmm. And when you think of platform orientation, that has less to do with what my area has to do in one versus what the collective has to do across the platform one. Mm -hmm. And okay, also collective in our operational areas. We've uh, worked very hard to consolidate a lot of things. And so, you know, we could take years to do things, which we don't have time. I, don't, I think, you know, we're a, a juxtaposition. And, um, you know, I think working ha hand in hand, technology working hand with operational partners, working hand in hand with partners like Availity that are very well versed and positioned to help, as well as like uh, those that are on the cusp or the seams of uh, technology that are going to help us uh, circumvent, I think, some of the uh, administrative burden that we've had. And, you know, we've, you know, we've worked, we're working with a number of different partners, but I think you know, I'll take one example, yeah. claims. Um, you know, my area, I don't have those systems. Yeah. It's another colleague of mine that has those. Mm -hmm. And then operationally, we support the same partners. Mm. And when we have technology yeah. partners like yourselves, and we're like, okay, how do we do that? So you say, okay, you know, maybe you go upstream so that I get it right in terms of the off yeah. uh, and, and do front end claims editing as an example, right? So, and do the off to claims match better. So I think these are, um, the day and age of us like thinking in our small little vacuum silos is not going to work, no. whether it's within your org or within, within tech or within, within our partners, if they're thinking about solutions that don't have uh, contiguity across uh, a platform-based orientation. By the way, I'll just add that that's one of the things that I've experienced differently in the last five or six years is people in the roles that each of you have um, are now driving more collaboration across your organization because to your point, these silos, I remember a conversation with, a, with, with the person who ran payment integrity uh, for a large health plan uh, at our annual conference and we were talking about our new overpayment application to try to move more of it up front and we were standing, he and I were standing in the back and he goes, well, we recovered a billion dollars in overpayments last year, best year we ever had. And this year I got a bigger bogey, right? I got to recover 10% more. And I turned to him and I said, why did you overpay by a billion dollars in the first place, mm -hmm. right? And there was this kind of reactive look like, oh yeah, why did we overpay by a billion dollars in the first place? But again, to your point, that was their budget. That was their function within the organization is the, 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 the entity, I won't name them, cause, but it's true with every plan that we work with, it's sort of, that was the status quo, that we know we're going to over, over play, overpay some amount of claims every year. It just is what it is. So let's make sure that we're, we're clawing it back, is what providers would say, right? They don't call it recovery, they call it clawback, as effectively and largely as possible. And um, we are certainly seeing more sort of cross-collaboration of like, well, let's get the payment integrity people in the room as we're thinking about claims, 
and claims editing and things like that to really um, find ways to innovate collaboratively across the organization. The implication, I think, for those of us in the room who are vendors to firms like yours is be ready to talk about different business models. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you could each speak to that a bit, but I mean, we are absolutely being asked, and I, and I love this personally, to take risk um, for return alongside our, our clients. So I'm curious, that's a little bit off, off script here, but how do you feel about those kinds of models? And is that what you expect from your technology uh, vendors to be open to that kind of thing? Yeah, please. Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, exactly. Right, so um, yeah. to me, I think it was important, um, um, like, times where we don't have uh, the, the bandwidth or the necessary runway to like say, okay, is this gonna work? Let's do a pilot and another pilot, another pilot. Mm -hmm. but, like, but if you're willing to say that um, front end investments, for example, we will look at that yeah. and say, look, we'll sign up again in the same way that I sign up with my operational partners, yeah. that our partners sign up for those operational savings, not just declare them. Not say, hey, there's an ROI that's attached to this, but actually sign up for them in the same way that I do. Uh, now you've got skin in the game, right? And, and I think more and more business models are going to like um, embrace those sorts of partners that are going to be willing to like uh, think about things differently and have skin in the game just like us. Yeah. Colin, thoughts on that? I agree. No. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I do agree. Um, the, to me, the idea of risk in a technology partnership um, like ours, I mean, that's great. We can, as long as we can tie back to specific things um, that clearly drive the ROI, like implementation yeah. timelines and adoption and things like that. The question of risk more broadly is getting, uh, is getting more and more difficult yeah. as folks come out of the woodwork with great ideas, good innovation across the system. Um, there's only one premium dollar and right. you can only carve it up into so, so many, many different mm -hmm. areas. And the stacking of risk on risk when it comes to things that are vendor deals but look a little bit like provider deals uh, is, is getting more and more confusing just because of the proliferation of offerings. Yep. So I think that's exciting. It's our job to, have, to be able to stack the risk the way that we, that we think is, is most appropriate. But uh, it's a challenge because we, we do these deals and we don't want to turn over these deals all the time. So right. you, you like to get a, a member into a particular provider and a particular vendor and all of these other things that make sense for them. Um, if you change them all the time, that's disruptive to the member. Um, but at the same time, if you do these big deals and then a whole bunch of new stuff comes out of the woodwork as great new ideas, you do have to figure out yeah. what do we change because there's only one premium dollar. Yeah, exactly. Could I, could I add Yeah, on please. Yeah, yeah. Colin and I yeah. were talking in the background. We have a big partnership going between our respective companies and critical in that partnership was creating the win-wins. Um, and not just for now, but into the future, where we both feel really happy. And, and I think my conclusion coming from the outside in is there's so much opportunity to further partner, break down the barriers, and make sure that premium dollar is reduced as much as possible yeah. um, in the context yeah. of, of the patient, mm -hmm. um, but also is optimized, and, and we don't have so much waste. And so lot of great opportunities for further partnership. We have our SureScripts um, team in the second row here, a great example of a platform um, that is driving technology adoption that reduces administrative burden. Um, we still have a lot of faxes yeah. around prior auth, but 75% of the auths are now e-prescribing. That's a great example of a tech company yeah. who has partnered with so many of us to fill a gap and break down the boundaries. Again, I, I think we gotta keep doing more and more of that. On the Evernorth side, we're partnered up with Amazon Health. Mm -hmm. Amazon Health wants to take away some of our business, um, but we know that working together yeah. can drive a different outcome. That's, that's fascinating. By the way, with a great new CEO at SureScripts and uh, Frank Harvey, who is Indeed. just a delightful Indeed. guy. Um, so I'm gonna, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a bit about um, the application of tech and particularly the application of AI. So I just want to sort of get your perspectives and how you're managing you know, a lot of excitement uh, around the application of AI. Even this week, net new rules and policies and proposals coming out of the federal government for the ethical 
application, this notion of red teams that are going to be looking at everybody's generative AI to make sure that it's based upon, you know, unbiased uh, uh, rules and um, policies and procedures. How, how do you think about that? And is that a net sort of positive to the rapid deployment or is it something you think about as problematic? Do you want to Whoever wants to start. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I, um, <laughs> I think I, I, the good news is it's not something we're just thinking about now, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, I think it's been an evolution as, as the AI journey has happened and now with the acceleration with Gen AI, it's become even more important to have uh, responsible uh, AI and to be thinking about our application, have governance models and sort of um, ML ops um, sort of um, uh, positioning. So I think there's one, what, there's one set of notion like, hey, everything's going to be automated. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, is it really? And so I think start where uh, it's most important for us to reduce the rework, to reduce the yeah. administrative yeah. burden yeah. and the human in the loop is always going to be there, particularly in a realm like healthcare, where um, you don't want to have bias, you don't want to have uh, decisions that are going to like right. uh, put risk by either parties, right? And so I think being responsible is part of like where we were, have been and where we continue to go and continue to uh, tighten up. I think the democratization of AI across the company, it maybe have used to be one area, you know, one data science area, but no, it's really uh, across our technology sphere and engineering teams are, are, are utilizing them as well and, and utilizing these models. And I give you one quick example. We have like, we started two years ago, this notion like clinicians and service agents, they have voice. And instead of just putting technology or telephony in place, I was like, you know, let's make sure that we use telephony as our future voice modality to yeah, activate yeah. workflow. And so today, um, our clinicians, our service agents are using that. So when they're on a call and they're having that conversation, that workflow or that transcription is happening, but also we're serving up information as it happens. Gen AI accelerated and said, okay, now we can like introduce yep. faster models. So I think safest places um, sometimes to start are like those are where like, you know, you've got a breadth of uh, rework that's going on, mm -hmm. a breadth of like uh, duplication and redundancy that's happening and over complication. So I think taking the burden off of, I, the associate that was running the prior off, yeah. years, like they have to do gymnastics, yeah. right? And so, and there's a lot of time and a lot of, a lot of things to put together. So like, let's make it easier to like serve that up yep. as they're having the conversation versus like, okay, I had the conversation. Now I have to do another set of notes. Then from those notes, I have to go to another set of guidelines and policies. And no, let's try and not, not even just bring up the information, but help sort of uh, serve up. These are possible scenarios. What do you think? Right. Particularly, don't you think that's true in processes that you, you do need to have an individual result for, but time and time and time again, they're going to end with the same result. So find ways to automate those and get the answers. One of the things that's impressed me is in our own application of AI in the auth space is reducing the latency of a response. Because when you talk to providers about, you know, auth is painful to everyone, plans and providers, and certainly to patients. You know, when you talk to, to uh, providers in particular about it, it's like, just get me the answer fast, right? I am, mm -hmm. I'm not asking you because I'm trying to make a decision tomorrow. I'm asking you because I need to make a decision now. Mm -hmm. And I know with our own application of it, with our Auth AI product, we've reduced that latency from you know, a day to 90 seconds. And the answer is the same, right? But it's, it's served up in a real-time response to an auth request. So if there does need to be a phone call or to your point, a clinical you know, human intervention, you can have that while the patient is still standing there waiting yeah. versus, you know, versus down the road. Yeah, and I think it's important that the human stays in the loop in those yeah. conversations, right, in those decisions, 100%. but you've, you've simplified upstream so that uh, you know, the information coming in is cleaner and the decisiveness of able to make decisions the human can make. So I think we're, we're smartly playing in this space and I think uh, it's important to continue that on regardless of how aggressive the onslaught of technology will be as, as we uh, um, interact. Chris or Colin, thoughts on sort of the ethical application, how your organizations are thinking through that? I think, you know, particularly in the, the Medicaid space, I think it's yeah. super important with a vulnerable population. 
Yeah, it, it is. And, and I'll briefly going back, I mean, most of our revenue comes from the government and therefore the oh, priorities yeah. are, are our yeah. priorities. Um, they, have, they have a lot of thoughts around this. One of them is not getting ahead of ourselves, but it doesn't mean we don't use technology. The, I guess the, one of the reasons I, re I really like this panel is the healthcare is personal and the human in the loop, all this stuff is super important. Healthcare is personal, but the administration of healthcare is not personal. And so there is a lot of stuff great, great. on this side where we can do things that the members don't see or care about. They just want it to work and work fast. Um, so we can deploy a lot of technology internally that is less cared about by either the state, our state partners or, or the federal government or our members. Um, the, the important thing to us is figuring out what their needs are and trying to get them met. And there are a lot of cool companies that are doing innovative things where they're deploying a lot of technology and we're helping them with that. But for members who have serious mental illness or yep. you know, they're age blind disabled members or a, you know, substance use disorder, they may most need a peer recovery specialist to come you know, support them and make sure they uh, get their driver's license or something like that. So technology can be used to identify the members who need mm -hmm. help the most. It can be used to, you know, by, by our partners um, to, to be more efficient, but ultimately, boots on the ground really matters and meeting people's needs really matters. Yeah. Um, the technology just plays a background role there. But I mean, on the on directly answering the ethical um, question, this, I, I defer to my technology expert peers here. So we're gonna do a quick round robin. I want Chris, you to answer that, take a mm -hmm. shot at that question, but then take 30 seconds. What are you excited about? Look forward three years, two years, right? We're moving fast. You know, what excites you about, about the future? Yeah, back to the AI topic for a moment, I would say key, and Gita and I were talking about it before, the flow of data. Um, without really in, you know, timely, accurate data flowing from all of the different parties to the healthcare system, we can't even apply AI, um, or we can only apply it in, in certain ways. So, so I would say that's one thing. In terms of the ethical application, I'm with Gita here, hu human in the loop for now, we are improving the way we leverage Gen AI combined with other technology to, to better understand the answers, to take out the biases, mm -hmm. and that this is so dynamic. It's, it's very, you know, it's a very moving, um, moving aspect there. What am I excited about? The continued partnerships, um, that we are starting to see, again, across the different parties in healthcare and the application of, of technology, Gen AI, AI tool and toolkit, there are so many other aspects and it's coming at us fast. And I think what we're seeing is so many different concerns are embracing tech now yeah. um, and trying to use it for good and trying to drive affordability. I think there's also just this great recognition that the healthcare system is very broken but we are on the cusp of, uh, of fixing it. Awesome. Gita? Yeah, well said. Uh, and, we, and the thing is, we were talking a lot behind the scenes as well. So what's good is like, um, you know, the business that we're in, you know, your, the story that you have with your daughter, I mean, we're, uh, it's always been like, I've worked across many different industries and I, and I stayed within healthcare because until we crack this nut, I feel responsible yeah. to crack this nut because it is, we are, we are like engaging people at the most vulnerable moments yep. or the significant moments in their health. And I'm excited yeah. about saying, well, yeah. how do I play a role? And the reason why I'm even more excited, and I said the day of continued compromises among, amongst respective areas, I think we're like reducing that with the transparency that there is with uh, Gen AI and saying, you gotta be aggressive, you gotta move faster but still be responsible. And I'm excited about like the pace that we've got to move now awesome. because it used to be that, you know, when you join healthcare, it's so slow. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if we can count. We'll be I, able by to the way, carry I know that how, because Gita's always pushed on us, you guys need to move faster. That is a common <laughs> thing. So I know that she, she walks the walk and talks the talk. <laughs> Colin, you want a last word? Sure. Uh, I'm excited about eliminating the noise. And we, there's a lot of stuff that we do not super well, and, and we can do it better with a lot of these tools that are coming out now. And every, everybody gets into healthcare because of the mission at some, at, yeah, at yeah. some level, some meaningful level. That includes that payers. I mean, that really is the case. 
we don't like spending a lot of our time doing admin Fun. functions that could be automated and replaced. Um, it does not make sense how much time I spend trying to make our provider directory accurate yeah. for our members. Exactly. Great. Um, there are all kinds of things like that. And I'm excited that it, the innovation that's happening now, I think, will allow us to leapfrog, some of, get, get out of some of those things, and, and really focus on serving the members and, and having productive relationships with all the stakeholders in the system. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you all. This has been a delightful panel to moderate, and thank you so much for your time, and thank you all for listening to us today. Enjoy the rest of the day.